Welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ this morning. It's so great to be together in worship. We have a full day this morning uh, of celebration. First of all, we are celebrating this morning um, Pentecost. This is the uh, birthday, so to speak, of the church, the day that the, the Holy Spirit came on the disciples in the upper room and started this whole thing. So we, we do celebrate that uh, this morning. Uh, in addition, we are celebrating this morning uh, the wonderful gift of this team and the music they've been sharing with us over the last several years. Amen. And sadly also saying goodbye, but we'll be celebrating them uh, in the gathering place following the, the service as well, especially Gabe's ministry. It's been wonderful. Um, this morning we are also celebrating uh, milestones in our children's lives. Uh, uh, some of our kids are kind of moving up to the next level in uh, our uh, Christian education, so we're going to be celebrating them and giving them their Bibles, and also celebrating our uh, high school graduates as they step on to a new uh, stage in life. So that'll be uh, midway through the service as well. And then finally this morning we are... Uh, uh, taking our special offering for the uh, famine that's going on in Africa. Uh, today is the last uh, Sunday that, that uh, you can get an offering into that. Uh, tomorrow's the actual deadline. We're going to be sending the check this week. So uh, just be praying for the, our brothers and sisters, most of them, <laughs> many of them are brothers and sisters in Africa who are really struggling right now. Uh, we are here because the Lord has drawn us together, redeemed us with his grace. He wants us to know him personally, to come fully alive and grow in him, and to go out into the world as a light, as healing, as grace. Um, that's what we're called to, to be as a church. So let's turn our full attention to the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your amazing love and Lord, as we gather uh, right now in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, meet us here by your Holy Spirit and open our lives to your presence, Lord, that we might um, truly worship you as you deserve in joy and in truth, full of the grace that is reflected from your face. Gracious God, we love you. We welcome you in this time. We worship you in the name of your Son. Amen. Let's stand together and worship God. So appropriate for the day of Pentecost, we're going to be doing a Pentecostal song. Ooh. Yeah, and and Jen is going to Jen is going to lead on the on the clapping. So just just follow oh, Jenna. Gosh. <laughs> a one, two, three, four. Whoa. I waited patiently upon the Lord And He inclined and heard my cry He pulled me up out of the miry clay He set my feet upon a rock He gave me beautiful ashes And joy for my morning and Praise for heaviness He put a new song in my mouth And a crown upon my head He gave me life forevermore You've been so good, so, so good to me So good, so, so good to me So good, so, so good to me Jesus, yeah, you've been so good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me, Jesus. Cause you pick me up and you turn me around and you place my feet on the solid ground. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, could you pick me up and you turn me around and you place my feet on the solid ground. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, cause you pick me up and you turn me around and you place my feet on the solid ground. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I remember when you pick me up and you turn me around and you place my feet on the solid ground. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You've been so good, so, so good to me. So good, 
good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me, Jesus. Yeah, you've been so good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me, Jesus. Yeah, you've been so good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me, Jesus. Yeah, you've been so good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me, Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Whoa, come on now. I got love, joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Whoa, sing it out now. Oh, I got love, joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Whoa, come on now. I got love, joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Whoa, sing it out now. Hallelujah. <laughs> Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting inside us. We cannot contain. Your love will surely come find us like blazing wildfires singing your name. God of mercy, sweet love of mine, I have surrendered to your desire.
nothing worth more that will ever come close nothing can compare your our living home in your presence Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord. Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for To be overcome by your presence, Lord Your presence, Lord Nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. Tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. In your presence, Lord.
gracious Father, we do ask that you come and meet with us here again by your Holy Spirit. Lord, it was your, your Holy Spirit that gave life to this world as it hovered over the waters at creation. Your Spirit has moved through the ages, inspiring your people to follow you more closely, demonstrating your glory and your grace. Lord, it was your Spirit that uh, came upon Mary that your Son might take flesh in our world and walk with us to redeem us your spirit that gave birth to the church Lord and gave us our purpose to go out into a darkening hurtful scary world and to overcome evil with love Lord God I, I look around today at our world and see that it is as in need of people filled with your spirit as it ever was Lord, each week a new terror attack, each day a new controversy, each hour, Lord, struggle. And yet you have promised that you are at work in your people to redeem us, Lord, to make us something that we can't even imagine, but that we will be filled with your glory and your beauty to a degree that um, would overawe us if we saw ourselves as we will be. So today, Lord, may your spirit come upon us again and help us to take one more step, one stubborn step of righteousness towards you despite what this world can throw at us, despite what this life will sometimes bring us, Lord, may we demonstrate the stubborn goodwill that you have shown us as we follow you still. And Lord, may that grace that we show be something that brings people to life, that this world might find healing as people see a new story, a different way of living, and the grace that stands beneath it all. Father, we once again surrender ourselves into your hands. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Spirit, remake us and remake this world. And we pray this, Lord, with confidence, knowing your goodwill as we've seen it in Christ, as we feel it still in your spirit. So we join with your people spread around this planet, Lord, and throughout time who have faithfully stood against the darkness as they trusted in you. And we pray with them the words that your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I hope you hear that prayer that we say every week, not as a dream or a wish, but as a triumph. For God is at work in us, and as we, his people, faithfully continue to follow him, he will continue to work at us. Uh-oh, red light, we'll need a new battery. Um, I would like to invite um, Amy Winans, are you here? Amy? Oh, there you are, right there. To come up, we'll start with our little kids giving away our Bible. I'll be right back with a microphone. Talk loud. Okay. So I'm going to invite up not just the kids, but also if you want or both, whoever's here representing kids wants to come up with a parent or guardian. Um, because we at Westminster re uh, recognize that obviously a huge part of your child's discipleship and knowing the Bible, God's word, comes from the parents. So um, this is who I'm inviting to come on up. We'll just make a big line up here uh, that everybody so we can start on this side. Yes. 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 Yes.
Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, now as we come to your word, reveal yourself to us. Show us your heart, Lord. Show us who you are, that we might know who we are. And Lord, lead us on, we ask in the name of your Son. Amen. We are wrapping up our sermon series this week on the transforming power of the gospel, how God redeems us takes the broken pieces that our lives sometimes become and puts them back together in a way that makes us more beautiful, a demonstration of His grace, more valuable, more loved. God, uh, in, in Christ's victory at Easter over sin, over death, over everything bad that this world can throw at us, He gives us a new start a new story. He remakes our lives. There is real power for change in the gospel. And I hope that you've been seeing that as we've been going through uh, this series. You know, it starts with God's redefining us in the midst of our brokenness, uh, his gift of unending, undeserved love. We are free from guilt, shame, fear. We are invited into a new story. And with that new identity, we can begin to apply that to our minds and we find literal change, literal, literal transformation. We, we talked uh, last week, I think, about the butterfly metaphor, more, just a couple of weeks before that, um, the idea that we are actually becoming different creatures. And the struggle is part of that, but we are, are growing, we are becoming something that we weren't before. We get to step into a better story and that literally reshapes our minds. We've been looking at our minds a lot and our bodies that we are changed as we 
surrender to change. That kind of makes sense, right? Um, but this is something we also work out in our daily habits of worship and surrender. Our connection to Jesus gives us purpose and strength, and we can keep trudging down that road of life sometimes because we can feel God working in us. We are becoming what we are not yet. But there's a promise there that is, is right in front of us, and every day is a step closer into it. Um, it's God's work, but we cooperate with it. And it's not easy. We're going to find our, that we fight against ourselves and against this world sometimes throughout the journey. But God has told us who we are. We are right now his children. So we can struggle and keep going back to that truth. We are already now his children. We're becoming more fully those children. I hope that this has helped you uh, over the last several weeks to think about ways that your life can be transformed practically. Uh, you know, as a pastor, I, uh, or as a preacher, rather, I, I often get, I, I like the theory stuff. I like theology. But the reality is if it doesn't make a difference in your life, what difference does it make? Right? Our theologies need to lead somewhere. And I pray that you continue to think these things through and say, what does this mean for me today? There's one more really important piece about this uh, that we're going to go through this morning. You know, if we really want to live into this alternate story that God is giving to us, if we really want to become all that God intends for us to be, we absolutely have to take this next step. We must begin to give it away. I want to share briefly a just picture of what that looks like from the book of Acts. This is a, a story, is the first um, recorded specific encounter um, of the church with the world following Pentecost. So uh, the, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and, you know, the disciples were transformed. They became the church. One minute they were a bunch of guys sitting in a room and ladies sitting in a room and the next minute they were a church with a purpose in the world. And then there's a, a brief description of what that community looks like in the end of Acts chapter 2 and then we get to this picture in Acts 3. The first kind of story of the church in action. And it's a defining moment. This is what we are intended to be. First picture, first glimpse of the church. Acts chapter 3 verses 1 to 10. Listen for the word of God. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. He's a beggar. And seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and enter the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who had sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this story tells the first recorded act of the newly born Christian church immediately following Pentecost. The first glimpse that we have of the church doing its work, what it is intended for. And it's a story of transformation. Change in a person's life. So obviously we look at this story and we only have a couple of minutes to look at this story this morning. I want to go so more in depth, but we just don't have the time. But here we go. We have a man and he's obviously transformed. I mean, that's the point of the story, right? We have this 40-year-old beggar. We find out in Acts chapter 4 that he's 40 years old. And his whole life, he's been brought to beg at the gate of the temple. So his whole life, he's sitting at the door of the church. And his life is not transformed. He's just asking for alms. 
He's never walked in his life and he needs healing, but he doesn't expect healing. He's been looking for the wrong thing. He's looking for alms. What, you know, it's a, kind of an old-fashioned word. Alms means what? It's money, right? He's looking for a gift, a charitable donation. But you know, alms would ever only be a temporary fix. They could allow him to buy food for the day, but they wouldn't change his life. In fact, a lot of the time, that's what the world is looking for. We are looking for alms. We're looking for temporary fixes. We are looking for escape or release or avoidance. You know, we watch movies, we play games, we take control of our lives by swiping our credit card and getting more stuff. Temporary control. We disappear into our workout routines or our projects or pour ourselves into our careers. And all of these things are alms. Right? Whether you're cracking open um, the, the fridge or cranking up the music or drinking it away or smoking it away, whatever it is that you're, you're doing, it's temporary. And none of those things will ever address the real problems of the human condition, that we are people who are born lame, that we're broken, that we're shattered. And there's a pain that comes with being humans. And we just look around and we say, my God, the world is not what it needs to be. And we can't handle that. And so we look for distractions. But all they ever will be are temporary distractions. And yet the gospel brings real permanent transformation. It brings change. And all around us are people who need just that. They need real change. They need to be something that they're not. They're getting alms from the world. What they really need is hope. What they really need is forgiveness. What they really need is grace. What they really need is someone to tell them they're, that they're beautiful or valuable. They need someone to tell them that they're precious. That they're a child of God. They're getting alms. What they need is God. You know, I, I, every time I turn on the news, I, you know, I was in the, in the gym yesterday and running on the treadmill and the whole time up in front of me on the TV is just more terror, right? 24-7, you turn it on and, and you're just being bombarded with the darkness. Our world needs transformation. But here's the thing, God doesn't expect us to give away what we don't have. And yet, what we do have, He does expect us to give away. So if you have ever received any transformation in your life from the gospel, any measure of hope, any measure of comfort or joy, that is what God expects you to give. Not what you don't have. He doesn't expect you to somehow tomorrow conquer terrorism with your good thoughts. But he does expect you to look the person next to you in the eye and offer the hope that you have, right? That's what Peter says later on in his letter. Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. Can you share the hope that you have? You do have. This gospel, however it has been helpful to you, is a gift that could be profoundly life-changing to the people that God brings into your life. Think about what Jesus has meant to you. Could he mean that same thing, that same grace that you've experienced? Could that be a gift you could give to the person next to you? Because of Peter and John, this man came fully alive and walked for the first time in his life. Because they looked him in the eye, they saw him as a valuable human being and simply gave what they had, a connection to the ultimate loving, life-giving God through Jesus Christ. Now, it's easy for us to dismiss this story because we say, well, yeah, but I can't heal people. Well, God isn't saying that you have to. He's just saying, give what you have. Now, some of you actually might be able to heal people. You just don't know because you've never given what you have. But here's the thing, whatever it is, whether it's hope, I mean, that might be what somebody needs more than walking 
to know that they are valuable. And I think that's the first thing that Peter and, and John give to this guy. They look him in the face. You know how easy it is to, to dismiss those people? We see them all over town. We don't even look at them anymore. You know, the other day I was on my way into a store, um, office supply store, and there's a guy sitting out front, and he was looking for alms, really, basically. He's looking for a handout, or, you know, he's selling trinkets. He's really looking for a, a handout. And, you know, he, he kind of accosted me on my way into the store. And, hey, oh, and, and I, was, I was walking really fast and, you know, momentum. So I just, the door opened and I started going through and I heard him grumbling after I, oh, just another, you know, wouldn't even look at me. So on my way out of the store, I just walked over and sat down with him. I didn't have any money. I just sat with him and said, man, it sounds like you're having a really rough day. Why don't you tell me your story? I was there for five minutes. I never gave him a thing. I didn't solve any of his problems. I just listened to him talk about living in a car with two teenagers. And, and you know, his life was hard. And I couldn't do anything about it. But when I got up to leave, he was more thankful than had I just handed him a buck on the way in. I mean, he took my hand and said, thank you so much. All I did was listen to his story. But that is a great gift that we can give to people, to look them in the eyes and say, you, my friend, are a human being. You're a child of God. You're precious. You matter. And for some people, they've been run over by the world so many times that that is just an impossibility in their minds. But they need it more than they need to walk, to know who they are. And that's a gift you can give. That's a gift we can all give. It's something we have. We're only expected to give what we have. But see, what Peter and John have, we also have this connection to the living God. And that's where the power is. The power for healing comes in the connection to Him. And we don't know what that looks like when we first uh, approach a person. So just give what you have. And let God sort out the details. Right? The gospel truly does have power to change us, to rewrite our lives, as this story tells us. This beggar's life has obviously changed, but, but I think that his is not the only life that is affected in this story. See, as Peter and John step into the purpose that Jesus has given them, they too are changing. This is no longer the Peter we saw throughout the gospels. Right? You look at that guy, and then you look at this guy, and they're not the same pe person. Peter is being transformed. And John is not the same shy young man we saw following Jesus throughout the Gospels. They are being transformed as they give away what they have. Something is changing in them. See, the power of the Gospel impacts on the lame beggar, but even as they share the Gospel, Peter and John, they're actually finally becoming the disciples that they were meant to be from the beginning. They're finally receiving the gift. You know, if I was to say somebody was um, a gifted musician, how would you know that somebody's a gifted musician? Only as you see them playing music, right? I mean, to be a gifted musician, yeah, it takes a lot of hard work and practice, but you only really know that a, a musician is gifted when they're actually performing. It's a gift that's being shared with other people. A gifted physician, same thing, all that study, all the medical school, all that, you know, the hard hours of practice. But you only know that a physician is gifted when they're actually healing someone, right? How do you know if, if an athlete is gifted? You only know if an athlete is gifted when they're on the field. So all of these gifts, and, and this I think goes throughout so much of our human existence, the gift is really only, it comes to life when it's given. Until then, it's just a potentiality. That's an understanding that the Christian church has had from the beginning. The gift that we've been given is really only received as a gift when we give it away. It seems kind of backwards, but that's the way we've always understood it. And again, I can point us back to some new discoveries in neuroscience and biology to back up what the Bible has been teaching for thousands of years. Right? Jesus tells us that if we want to save our lives, that we have to what? Lose it. Give it away. And we, we hear that and we're like, that, that makes no sense. Well, actually, it does make sense when you look at neuroscience and biology. Our brains agree with Jesus for some reason, maybe because he made them, you know. But I already touched on this in a different sermon series last uh, year, so I'm going to give you a really quick recap. A self-centered life and attitude that is 
focused on yourself and getting what you can do for yourself seems like a good deal, but your brain disagrees. See, that self-centered life and attitude tends to promote activity in the amygdala and the limbic system of the brain. That's, you know, that little model I gave you that's that, that fear center that pops off the, the cortices, the thinking part. It activates the fear center of your brain. So a self-centered, me-first life actually stirs up in you anger, anxiety, stress, fear, depression. All these things that our world struggles with coming from that section of your brain that is actually stimulated when you're selfish. And so that self-centered, me-first life actually ends up harming us at the very center of who we are. We end up more stressed, more depressed, more angry, more hurt, and our whole life suffers from it. But an outward-focused, generous, service-oriented attitude and lifestyle activate other parts of the brain, the parts of the brain associated with peace, connection, trust, spirituality, contentment. So you give yourself away and your brain's like, oh, that's great. And more than that, this calm, the connection, the contentment, that our brains benefit from these things, um, it also, the, being generous uh, gives the, the body a solid dose of dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. This is the trifecta of, of chemical, hormonal, um, goodness in your brain. I don't know. I'm losing my science here. Um, but th these are the things that are related to happiness, well-being, sleep and mood regulation, trust, intimacy, contentment. Again, your brain is so grateful when you give yourself away. Okay, that's good for your soul. It's good for your body. Again, our bodies and brains want us to give ourselves away. We are built for service. We are wired for generosity. We are made for connection. What Jesus taught and what the church has held up through the ages as an ideal is true by science. This is who we're supposed to be. We're wired. St. Francis sums it up uh, so well in his famous prayer. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are raised to eternal life. And it's not just theological niceties. It's true. This is all happening when Peter and John turn aside to this lame man even as they share the power of the gospel with him, the power of the gospel is flowing into them and shaping them. They're growing, they're learning. In a sense, this is when we actually become Christians. You know what Christian means? Little Christ. So we're only really Christians when we're little examples of what Jesus did. And what did Jesus do? Well, he fully gave himself away. So this is an opportunity for Peter and John to practice what they've been learning themselves. It's like little kids learning to write, right? They're intentionally working out a pattern that God has given them. They are following the lines that God has already shown in Jesus Christ, becoming the disciples God intended them to be. And of course, they're still not perfect. Peter will not too long from now be corrected publicly by Paul for having abandoned what he already knows to be true. Uh, because of the pressures of the world. But Peter and John are putting into practice what they, are, they were saying was a foundational belief from the beginning. They're learning even as they teach. And those of you who teach know that we sometimes learn best when we teach. Pastors, we sometimes learn best when we preach it. Half of our sermons are for ourselves. Sorry. We're learning like a kid learning to write, tracing those letters. The pattern's there. We just get to take our own little, well, big pencil, you know, and follow along. This is what it means to be a little Jesus. I'm practicing until those letters become second nature to us. We don't even think about them anymore because it's just who we are. That's what it means to be transformed in Christ. To take what you have, however small it is, Give it away. Give it away. And see how God not only replaces it, but expands it.
God never expects you to give anything you don't have. But what you do have, like Peter say, what I have, I give to you. So there we are. We've been given an incredible gift of God's grace. And the Lord offers us an entirely different story, a different definition for who you are. He has redeemed your past. He has assured your future. He is with you now. God is transforming you into something more valuable, more beautiful, more wonderful than you could ever possibly imagine. And for that to come fully to life in you, in your life today, you merely need to look around you to the people who constantly surround you and give what you have. Offer it back to God. Pay it forward. You, you pay God back by moving it forward to the people that he loves. Look around you and see a world in need. See people in need and simply give what you have. Let God work in you and through you and see how that continues to transform you and bring you higher and higher in the cycle. It goes back and forth, round and round as the grace builds and someday comes to perfection in you. Would you pray with me? Lord God, as we as we see what you have done, may you remind us that you want to do that in us. And more than that, that you want to do that through us in the lives of the people around us, people that you love dearly, people that you gave your life for. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. You know, I, I find it not at all surprising that the main celebrations of the church, the sacraments, are public celebrations. They're opportunities for us to look around at the people and say, look at what God's grace does. Every time we come to this table, we're reminded as, you know, look at all these great different breads from all around the world. We're reminded that the Lord is making something immense of us. He's drawing people from every nation and every language and every tribe and every socioeconomic class. He's, he's bringing everybody together into one family in Christ. When we come to Christ, we immediately be, belong to each other. And, and so we sit at this family dinner table and we celebrate the gift of grace. This is why Jesus took bread on the night that he was arrested. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You're changed. You're not who you were. Remember that. In the same way, after the meal, he took the cup and again, after giving thanks to his father, he gave it to his disciples and said, this cup is the new covenant, the new relationship with God, sealed in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. You're changed. You're not who you were. You're becoming more than you are. Remember that. Friends, in this meal, Christ comes to us in the bread and in the cup. He is at work in us still, transforming us. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. I'd like to invite the elders and deacons forward to help in service. The body of Christ is broken for you. The blood of Christ is shed for you. God comes to us. So come and meet him here. I invite you now to come, tear off a little bit of the bread, dip it in the cup, receive God's grace made tangible for you, and know that you are not the same. Let's worship God. Let's come to the table. Um, this next song I wrote a few months ago. 
and is about our spiritual pilgrimage as Christians. And it has three parts. The beginning part is God reconciling us, calling us out of the world. And um, it depicts how instantly we become aliens in this world because the, this world is not our own. We're, we're, we're prepared for the next world. So then the next part is a piano part, uh, no words, and it depicts our journey and the difficulty of that journey at times. And at the end uh, is, is sort of the Pentecostal, uh, being filled with the Spirit, uh, God being with us as we're going on our journey.
if you'd like to stand and join us. You hold the reins on the sun and the moon Like horses driven by kings You cover the mountains, the valleys below With the breath of your mighty wings All treasures of wisdom and things to be known Are hidden inside your hand and in this fortunate turn of events, you ask me to be a friend. You ask me to be your friend. Oh, and you, you are my first, you are my last, you are my future. future you are you have taken our past into your grace lord you are with us now lord may we extend this table of grace that we have feasted at into a world that is hungering for it and may it bring you glory as your people are healed this we pray in the name of christ amen
As we sing our last song together, let's also bring our offerings to God. Lord, I find you in the seeking. Lord, I find you in the doubt. And to know you is to love you and to know so little else I need you. Oh, how I need you. Oh, how I need you. Oh, how I need you. You know, I'd add a line to that song, Lord, I find you in the giving. See, as we, as we give him away, he opens up himself to us in a, in a brand new way. As we give away our musical gifts, we are blessed as God flows in. Go and give yourself away and grow from it. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you this day and every day. Amen.